David. Adonai Eroi lo yachsar, pinoteshi al bitzayni, al mei menuchot yenahaleini, lafshi el shovev, yarcheni v'maglei tzedek, leman shemo, gam keelech begeitz al mavet, לא יראה רע, כי אתה עמדי. שבטך ומשענתך, המה ינחמוני, תערוך לפני שולחן. נגד צוררי, תישנת ושמר ראשי. חוסי רוויה, אך טוב וחסד ירדפוני כל ימי חיי, ושבתי בבית אדוני לאורך ימים. As Cantor Schiffen began our service chanting, Psalm 23 in the Hebrew, please join me in the English. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He guideth me in straight paths for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil, my cup burneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Unwritten <coughs> third Psalm. Kirachem av al banim. Rachem Adonai al Yireav. As a father has compassion for his children, so does God have compassion for those who show reverence. God knows how we are fashioned. God remembers that we are dust. The days of mortals are like grass. We flourish as flowers of the field, but a wind passes over them and they are no more, and no one can recognize where they grew. But God's compassion is everlasting. God's kindness to children's children, to all the reverent ones, endures age after age, unchanging. V'chesad Adonai me'olam, v'ad olam al yirav, v'tid kato v'vnei vanim. We learn from Ben Sirach. We are all destined to die. We share it with all who ever live with all whoever will be. Cry for the dead. Hide not your grief. Do not restrain your mourning. But remember that continuing sorrow is worse than death. When the dead are at rest, let their memory be a source of peace and be consoled when the soul departs. Because death is better than a life of pain and eternal rest is better than constant sickness. Let us not seek to understand what is too difficult for us, nor search for what is hidden from us, nor be preoccupied with what is beyond us, for we have already been shown far more than we can understand. As a drop of water in the sea, as a grain of sand on the shore are our few days in eternity, the good things in life last for but a short time, but Ronald's good name will remain forever. Adonai Natam Varnai Lakach Yishem Adonai Mevarach The Lord has given, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We come together this afternoon to express our deep love and abiding respect and honor and 
to say goodbye to our dear beloved Ron Teitelbaum, who this week was taken from us. Our hearts are heavy with grief and a veil of tears covers our eyes. As we contemplate the loss of a truly extraordinary man filled with so much light and energy and humor and love, so much generosity and caring and giving, so much devotion to family and to friends. We come together to draw strength from each other and to draw strength from our memories of Ron and what he meant. And we hope that the memories today should be healing and bring comfort. I want to call upon a number of members of the family who are going to speak. First, I'd like to call upon four of the grandchildren, Aaron and Grant, Alyssa and Michaela, if you'll come forward. We are up here today together as a group because Papa loved having us around. If it was a family trip or pancakes at Nanny's, when the grandkids were together, he was happy. Max is in Israel right now, finishing up a trip for our grandfather's wishes. Just keep going and don't stop was what Papa said to Max before he left for his trip. <laughs> though, Max is not, though Max is not here today, he did help with these words. Papa loved his children, and somehow that love was intensified when it came to his grandchildren. He made his grandkids feel capable of anything and everything. It is evident when it came to every extracurricular, he was always there to support us with either sports, games, musicals, or a graduation. He was our coach. Uh, Papa was always there for advice and support. He couldn't have been a better grandfather or friend. We love him forever and remember his name, and we'll pass it on to our children. We love you, Papa. Now I'd like to ask Danny to come forward to share some words. First of all, I want to give a shout out to Max who's streaming this. Hi, Max. Um, and to everyone else that's watching that couldn't be here today because Ron was so loved. Um, most of you who know me know I'm good for a joke or lightening up the mood, but not today. This is usually where someone in this situation tells a funny story about Ron, but everyone in this room has a Ron story, and I want you all to focus on yours. That is who he was. If he welcomed you into his world, he opened his heart to you, and this is the beginning of any story about Ron. From the first day I met him, he welcomed me into his world and into his family. He did the same for Lorna and John. He was never just a father-in-law to me, but he was a second father. I hope that I can be the husband and father that he was. How am I doing, Jamie? Okay, one story about Ron. But this is more of a Natalie story. Bear with me. I remember the one day that Natalie was cooking and she spilled a whole plot of chicken and boiling grease and he burned his feet and I had to take him to the hospital because Natalie had to clean the floor. Ron's pride was Jamie, Ellen, and Howard. His joy was his grandchildren but his love is and always will be you, Natalie. You have impacted the lives of everyone here. You are loved and missed. Thank you. And finally, Howard is going to speak to us.
while back, I wrote each of my parents a letter to thank them for all the things they have done for me, the lessons they have taught me, and to tell each one of them how much I love them. This is some of what my father's letter contained. My dad taught us so many life lessons, not only with his words, but also with his actions. He taught us to be proud of who we are, to not be afraid to stand up for ourselves and our beliefs, to always do our best, no matter what the circumstances, and to make good choices. He taught us that family comes first, to work hard, provide for your family, and that sometimes you might need to sacrifice what you want for what your family needs. We learn to be in in involved in our kids' lives and that we needed to choose our own path. I can remember him being understanding when I broke a window playing baseball in the yard or when I almost caught the kitchen on fire. When I broke my ankle playing football, he was the one who got me over the difficulty and told me it would be okay. My mom and dad were our biggest supporters. I do not remember my dad or my mom ever missing a softball, football, basketball, wrestling match, or track meet growing up. It did not matter if I was gonna play or not. If I was involved in something, they were there. His belief of being there was extended to his grandkids. He would watch Aaron and Grant whenever he could attend their sporting events and concerts. It was a struggle for him to walk to the fields and to watch them play. But he always found a way, whether it was hitching a ride on the rec center's golf cart or, or sometimes watching from the car in the parking lot. We worked side by side as business partners for over 15 years. The man he was at home was the same man he was at work. He treated everyone with respect. Vendors, customers, and fellow sales representatives looked at him with both respect and admiration. I've heard from business colleagues all over the country telling me how much of a great man my father was. Over the years, the only arguments the only argument we would get in, into would be a result of our frustration for me trying to teach him how to use a computer. I will always remember traveling with my father. He was showing me where the best ice cream was in every town or where he would buy flowers for my mom. My father loved going to the major shows in Las Vegas and Houston. During the day, you could find him working with customers and going from booth to booth talking to friends. At night in Vegas, you could find him at either the crap table with my mother or at three card poker. I'll never forget, <laughs> stories. I missed a flight to Vegas one day. To say he was not happy would be an understatement. By the time I got to Las Vegas, he had calmed down. However, we still laugh that the first words when I saw him were, how could Lorna let this happen? <laughs> As he got closer and closer to retirement, my mother and I would say he needs a hobby. He has no hobbies. I didn't realize at the time, but his family was his hobby. We meant everything to him. He was committed to making sure my mom had a good life. He was committed to making sure Jamie and Ellen and I had the childhood and the relationship with him and mom that he did not have with his parents. After retirement, we would go for lunch or talk on the phone or just talk at his house. We would talk about everything, the kids, business, Lorna, and my mom. When something good happened, I couldn't wait to tell him. If something bad happened or if I had issues with work, he was there to offer support and guidance. No conversation was off limits. I will miss this more than anything, the conversations that we had. I cannot put, out, put down on paper all the things I have learned from him. The speech was much longer earlier. He was my friend, my partner, but most of all, a great father. And I will try every day. Whew. 
I will try every day to live the way he and mom taught me. Thank you. Aaron and Grant and Max and Alyssa and Michaela, Danny and Howard. How beautifully you have shared with us your feelings and memories, your love for Ron, for your father, father-in-law, your grandfather, and what he meant to you. And your words touch us all very, very deeply. There's a saying from the rabbis of the Talmud, the Varim Han Yosim Halev Nichlesim Lelev, that words which come from the heart penetrate the heart. And your words penetrate our heart today because we hear the resonance of their truth and all the qualities we see in him that you experienced in the family. Ron was a loving, caring, devoted husband to you, Natalie. A loving, proud father of you, Jamie and Daniel, Ellen and John, Howard and Lorna. A loving, proud grandfather of you, Alyssa, Max, Michaela, Nicholas, Caitlin, Grant, and Aaron. He was also a loving brother of Bernard of Blessed Memory and a devoted son to Jesse, Bertha, and Emmanuel, all of blessed memory, a loving uncle and a friend who touched so many people's lives in so many ways. Ron was a big guy <laughs> with a big smile and a big heart and a big laugh and wonderful sparkling eyes that were filled always with joy. That's the way I think of him, the way he always was whenever I saw him, whenever I saw him with you, Natalie, at synagogue or in the community, with your family. He lived his life with a very strong sense of joy a gratitude for the gifts in his life, an appreciation for each of you that was born of his deep love for you. And I know your love for him was equally deep. I pray that God should send you all comfort and that all your memories bring you healing and that you always carry with you all the beautiful memories of this truly good neshama, as the Yiddish expression says, a phrase Natalie likes to use about Ron that so describes him so beautifully well, a good soul, a ba liv tovam, master of a good heart. May you always feel him with you. Ron was born December 14th, 1932 in New Rochelle. His family lived in a small apartment off an alleyway by the A&P. When he was three years old, his mother Bertha died, and he was sent to live with an aunt and uncle in Florida for about a year. But then his father remarried to Jesse, and Ron moved home to be raised by his father and stepmother. By age 12, he had a paper route. Yes, he drove the car to deliver the newspapers to apartments. You could do that in those days. Don't try that today. He played the saxophone in high school, Mamir Nikai, but he sold it to help pay for college. He studied at NYU majoring in labor relations and graduated in 1954. And he went to work for Hart, Schaffner, and Marx. 
And then around 1957 or 1958, Ron made a fateful decision and went into the lingerie business working for Form Fit Rogers. They had a really good sales program and he had a wonderful career there. He was very talented at what he did. After all, sales is all about building relationships with people, appreciation and trust. Everybody loved Ron. How could you not buy from him? He rose to be in charge of a territory the size of one quarter of the United States. He had many, many sales reps underneath him. And then, Natalie, you came along. It was 1959. You met at Crystal Beach. This is just north of Buffalo on Lake Ontario. Beach bungalows where people would go for vacations and the boys went up there to play cards and they invited the girls to come up for a party. You went up, he saw you, he was smitten by you. He asked you out the next night and you accepted. And why shouldn't you? He was so good looking and a little older, sophisticated and debonair. Your first date was at Cory, swimming at the beach and then out to dinner. You told me you were wearing this outfit with a giraffe pattern on it and you spilled spaghetti on it. That didn't seem to faze him. He was hooked on you. You dated for 11 months, but he actually proposed to you after only a couple of weeks. Why did you then date so long? Because he proposed to you and you accepted, but you said, I've got things to do. You were going on a cross-country trip with your girlfriends for two months. So the relationship would have to wait till you got back. And then you dated a while longer. But you were married on May 15th, 1960, on Lagba Omer, which just passed not very long ago. The one day that you can get married after Passover and before Shavuot at Temple Emmanuel in Buffalo. The two of you had a wonderful relationship. You were so deeply in love and you so enjoyed each other, enjoyed being with each other and sharing in life with each other and building a family with each other. You moved to Cleveland because it was close to Buffalo and there were good department stores here for business. You set up home here and ultimately built your family here. And you told me it's been a good home, a good place to raise your family, where you've made wonderful friends. And you said that Ron was very easygoing, a good guy and good to everybody with a heart of gold. You were deeply in love and you did so much together. You shopped together. Well, you shop. He waited while you shop. You bowled in a couple's league. You traveled the world, including Australia, which he really loved and wanted to go back, and New Zealand, and of course Israel, and many, many cruises. He loved cruises. He especially loved to take the children and grandchildren away with you to Mexico, Punta Cana, and on many cruises. The first time that he took the family away on a vacation, you shared with me was to Dearborn, Michigan, to see Greenfield Village. And he arranged for the Holiday Inn there to put a welcome to the family on the sign for the hotel with the family name. The last time you were together was a family cruise to the Caribbean. And that cruise, Ron was already in a scooter. He was not able to stand, supposedly. But somehow, he stood three hours at the craps table. Well, he had a big winning streak that day. And as you already gathered from Howard's remarks, he loved to gamble. He also loved golf and tennis and softball. He played softball long enough that he could wait for Howard 
to turn 21 and be able to enter the adult softball league, and they played together for a year. But then Howard, you didn't want to play anymore, and so he quit. Because it really wasn't about the softball, it was about you, because he wanted to be with his kids. He loved parties for any occasion, especially for his birthday. Together, Natalie, you and Ron were married for 59 years. 59 years. That's more than half a century. That's a lifetime. A lifetime in which the two of you shared together in facing life's challenges and celebrating life's blessings and building a home and a family and a legacy of love and creating this extraordinary family that is so close together and holds tight to each other and looks after each other and loves being together. That was Yer and Ron's greatest accomplishment, creating this beautiful family, this circle of love. Ron was a very, very loving father. He was strict. He didn't say too much. He didn't have to. He was, as we said, a big guy. So maybe a little intimidating. Just his presence was enough. And when he was out of town, if you were into mischief, your mom would say, just wait till your father gets home. And you knew she meant it. He had all these wonderful New York expressions. He didn't like when the children or grandchildren would be at the table with their cell phones. He made you put them all away. Before his cell phones, he was trying to keep everybody off the landline. He would say, hold the wire. He also used to say, she doesn't know a chicken from a chicken salad. An expression in Yiddish that I wrote down, but I'm afraid I won't say it right. It meant, go slam your head in the wall. Or Y is a crooked letter. Or stand on your head and spit nickels. And Jamie, Ellen, and Howard, each of you had different relationships with your father, in part because of the differences in age and different stages in life in which he raised each of you. Jamie, you told me that you never remember ever hearing an argument, ever having an argument with him. Ellen, you said, well, maybe there was some arguing, <laughs> but it was because you were so much alike. Two very strong personalities who cared very deeply and wanted what was best. And Howard, you were the baby, so he was less strict with you, very understanding. And you shared with us about the broken window and the kitchen. None of it rattled him. He provided for all of you, and he set a great example for you. He was your confidant to all of you. He gave you advice. He would play devil's advocate just to make sure that you thought things through. He liked to joke around. He could sometimes be sarcastic. He taught you good morals and values. He taught you the importance of a work ethic that has guided you each through your lives. How would your relationship evolve differently because you worked so closely with him in the business? You spent day in and day out with him. Your desks were next to each other, first in Jamie's old bedroom and then in your basement in Solon. So you talked all day about all kinds of things. He was a mentor and a business partner. Danny, John, and Lorna, you also all enjoyed a very close, loving relationship with Ron. He treated you as his own children, no different, as if you were all his flesh and blood. Danny, he was like a second father to you. He was always looking out for you and somehow had a sixth sense. He knew if you were ever upset or something was wrong. You had a very special relationship. John, you shared memories of the time that you 
took Ron to the emergency room. You were with him in the house. I don't remember all the details. You were sleeping in the family room. Ron was in the bedroom, and uh, he was coughing, and you kept going into him and saying, maybe we should go to the emergency room. No, no, I'm fine, I'm fine. You try to sleep, but you couldn't sleep because he was still coughing and coughing, and you go back in and say, let me take you to the hospital. No, no. And then finally, late in the night, he finally said, okay. Turned out he was having a heart attack. And the truth is, John, you probably saved his life. And Lorna, when you were going through a very difficult and challenging time, he was there for you, to stand by you and to support you and to help you through. He loved all of you as his own. You were not sons or daughter-in-law. You were sons and daughter-in-love. Ron and Natalie, your house growing up was the gathering place for all of your children's friends. Everyone was welcome. Ron worked long, hard hours and traveled for work, but weekends the family was always together. He coached all of your baseball games. He was commissioner of the girls' league and he taught you all how to play baseball. He was a good coach. He would tell you like it was. Once, Howard, you were upset because you didn't make the league's all-star team, and you asked your father why. After all, he was the coach. How could you not make the all-star team? And he said to you, just straight, because you didn't get the votes. But whatever you were into, your father was also into. Howard, you played baseball, wrestle, football, and basketball. Jamie, you did drill team. Ellen, cheerleading. He was at all of your games and performances. He never missed a one. And it was the same with the grandchildren, as you heard, never missing anything they did as well. And as you became adults, your relationship with your father deepened. You grew to appreciate the sacrifices your parents had made for you, to understand the depth of his love for you and what the lessons were he was seeking to teach you and you grew ever closer. And oh, how Ron adored and loved and was proud of his grandchildren. You were the jewels in his crown. He always wanted to be with you. He always wanted to know what you were doing. He always talked about you. Every conversation centered on the grandchildren. And when any of you were in college and you came home, he would slip you some spending money he followed your progress in school. He wanted to know your grades, how you were doing. That was very important to him. Seder was always together as a family. He would turn to Jamie to figure out where you were in the book. He probably didn't notice where he was because he was too busy felling. He listened to everything that you, his grandchildren, had to say, and he loved you all so much. Michaela, he was your personal chauffeur. He took you to and from school. Aaron, he loved the same teams you did and would watch them with the TV turned up very loud. He would also watch ESPN Sports News as it looped over and over and over again showing the same playbacks and repeating the same scores it didn't matter he watched it there are memories of subs at the Bellas and watching the Blue Bloods he loved that show about cops because it was about a big Irish family and it always ended with the family sitting down to dinner he liked that and he wanted to make sure you all got that message stay together as a family and you all did he took you all to cedar point every year he would go on water rides and on cars with the kids i think once he was in a scooter if i remember right he kind of pushed one of you into a i don't know a wall or something you know you survived he cherished those times every moment he could be with you Ron was also very involved in synagogue and in serving the community. Natalie, you and Ron were members originally of Heights Temple, and then you followed Rabbi Rube to Congregation Bethenu. And 
then later developed a very close relationship with Rabbi Sukol and then with Rabbi Shapiro. And then we were very blessed that you came back to Heights Temple to B'nai Yeshurun and rejoined us. And Rabbi Rudin Luria and Kenneth Schiffman and myself, we feel so blessed and so lucky for our friendship with you and with your family, for knowing your children and grandchildren, seeing the joy that you bring each other, and we want you to know you bring us joy too. In the community, Ron was always involved in something. He served on the committee that built the first ever safety town in the country, which was here in Beechwood. He also served on the committee that built the Beechwood indoor pool. He was for many years a volunteer fireman, and he was the campaign manager for Saul Eisen when he ran for school board. He never did any of this for accolades. He just always wanted to give back to the community, to make a difference, to help others, to make sure that there was a good place for his children and grandchildren to live. He was a good negotiator, always rational, always able to point out the good and bad in every situation. He was also a good friend, and he supported those around him physically, emotionally, and sometimes financially. In the fall of 1982, Ron went to New York to the offices of Form Fit Rogers, for whom he was working, and found the office padlocked. Can you imagine what that experience would be like? No one had told him. He had no advance warning to know that the company had shut down. And overnight, he had to decide what he was going to do. A friend told him he should consider becoming an independent rep, that it would take three or four years to establish himself, but it could be very profitable. And so Ron did. He built up his own business using his contacts, his interpersonal skills, his knowledge and talents, and he was indeed very successful. And Howard, you went to business, as we said, and worked with your father side by side and then ultimately took it over when your father finally retired. You and your father together did a mix of different kinds of lingerie, some of it more conservative, but as you said to me, you know, you got to follow the money. Ron wasn't working for some big company that was going to cut him a check anymore. You have to sell what will sell. And what was selling was the sexy lingerie products. So you shifted from house dresses to nylon gowns to baby dolls. Sold laundry in lingerie shops and department stores and boutiques. But then also at other kinds of places that sell or use sexy lingerie. And then when the market shifted, you started selling Halloween costumes because, as you said, you follow the money. Ron had a sense of what was going to sell, of where to take the business so it could be successful so he could provide for his family, and he adapted to the market at every turn. And then the business morphed back to more basic goods again. He was always looking for new lines, new opportunities. And Howard, when you entered the business, it was very important to him to make sure that his clients treated you as a full equal partner in the business and that they gave you the same trust and respect that they gave him. Ron was loved in this business by all of the people who he did business with because he was so good hearted and because he was honest and trustworthy and because he cared. He retired five years ago when you all threw a big party for him, and one of your clients sent a big check to help cover the cost of the party. He said, all I want is a picture of the family in return. And that was an indication of just how much he was loved by the people with whom he did business. After he retired, he would go out and meet his friends for breakfast and go to Mondays at the J to hear speakers. He took many classes from Baldwin Wallace that were held at Temple Emmanuel and classes at Siegel College. He loved to learn, and he was brilliant. He was very smart. Most people didn't know how much knowledge he held in his head, how bright he was, because he didn't flaunt it. 
but he loved studying history and politics and had a particular interest in studying the decisions of the Supreme Court. On the other hand, technology was not his thing. Howard used struggle to teach him to use the computer, even to figure out how to move the cursor. And he even had trouble dialing the fax machine. But he did figure out the Kindle. And he used it a lot because he was an avid reader. He loved crime novels and spy novels especially, and he could finish an entire book in just a couple of hours. You have all these wonderful memories of times with your father when you were young. He used to spend a lot of time in Michigan. He would hop on 480, and then he would pick up his cell phone. He had one of those first cell phones, you know, the big ones. He would call home for what Howard called the didjas. Did you do this? Did you do that? Checking up on them. But he didn't need cell phones to do that. Before there were cell phones, he used to carry a big bag of coins with him. And he knew where every payphone was along the route so that he could call home. And as you heard, he also knew where every ice cream store was. His favorite flavor was butter pecan. Or where he could buy flowers for Natalie or black raspberries around the 4th of July. He also loved donuts, by the way. And I'm told that today is National Donut Day. His favorite was jelly donuts. And he loved black licorice, which was great because nobody else did. So any candies like Good and Plenty or others that had the black licorice pieces, he got to eat them all. Never mind, by the way, that he was diabetic. But he had a sweet tooth, and somehow he managed. He loved the holidays. He especially, Natalie, loved your cooking. And he would buy you gladiolas for the holidays. Even when he was in the hospital, he made Ellen buy you flowers for your anniversary. And when the holidays came, he used to tease you about how much money you would spend and how much food you were preparing. But the truth is, he loved it. He loved all of your cooking. He loved being with the family. He loved those holiday tables. He liked eggs, but he only liked to eat the yellow yolks of the eggs not the whites. So Jamie, you used to eat the whites and give him your yellows. And Michaela, you picked up that habit and did the same. Howard, you and Ron went to the World Series here in Cleveland with together. And Ellen, you and your father went to the All-Star Game in 1995. And Ron was at the 1964 World Championship Game for the Browns. He had tickets for the Browns for some 40 years. He also had tickets for the Cavs, but he couldn't give those away once LeBron left. And when he went to the Indians, he knew just where to enter so he could walk near the kosher hot dog stand. He loved to play golf with his friends. He was a really good golfer when he was young, not so much when he was older, but he enjoyed it just to be out with his gang. And he also had this very special love of clowns. And he had this collection of clowns that he gathered from all over the world. They were very special to him. And it's not hard to understand why he liked clowns, because he was a bit of a jokester himself. He loved to make people laugh. He was funny. And that's why everybody liked him so much. But he could also be serious. And he taught you all many, many very important life lessons that you will take with you into the future. Ron passed away during this week, immediately before the holiday of Shavuot, which will begin Saturday night. And the Jewish calendar is created in such a way that the Shabbat immediately before Shavuot we always read the exact same Torah portion, the portion of Bamidbar, the first portion in the book of Numbers, the book which describes the wandering of the Israelites in the wilderness. And in the Jewish calendar, 
Every week is known by the Torah portion that is read on the Shabbat that caps the end of that week. Ron passed away in this week of Bamidbar. What is in that parsha, And how does it connect to Ron? What is the meaning of that timing? One of the things that is prominent in the portion is that God gives instructions regarding the encampment of the Israelites around the tabernacle in the wilderness. How each tribe should be arrayed in concentric squares around the tabernacle and how they were to march in that exact same formation. And the Torah tells us a curious detail that each person was to be in his encampment with his flag. Each family was to stay within their tribe and to camp where their tribe was and march with their tribe together with the flag that was emblematic of them and represented them. Each of the 12 tribes, therefore, had a different flag. And over time, the tradition ascribed symbols that we say appeared on each of those flags that represented something about the essence of that tribe. So, for example, the tribe of Judah was represented by a lion, the fierce king of the forest, because the line of King David, the dynasty, was to arise from the tribe of Judah. And the tribe of Zvulun, its flag had a sailing vessel because the tribe of Zvulun settled along the coast of Israel and they were, according to tradition, sea merchants. The tribe of Don, the word Don means to judge, so its symbol was a set of scales. The tribe of Binyamin was the home of the Temple Mount and so on its flag a picture of the temple. So I was thinking to myself, each person has a flag under which they encamp and under which they march. A flag that embodies the essence of who they are. What is on Ron's flag? And the answer was obvious to me. You are. His family. Because the single most important thing in Ron's life was his family. Everything that he did, ultimately he did for you. To give joy to you, Natalie. To give a good life to his children and grandchildren. To give them joy. To set you on the right path. To teach you the lessons to succeed in life to build a Jewish community and a synagogue and a broader community that would nurture you and enable your families to thrive. Everything he did, his work, his play, his time with family, his time with community, his giving was all done for you. That's Ron's flag, the flag of family. And that's the great legacy that he leaves. He taught you all how to live life with grace and with humor, how to love every person and find the good in everyone and the good in every moment. He taught you how to rise to life challenges, but to see life as an optimist. He taught you to seek out the skills you need to succeed. But most of all, he taught you to seek out each other to hold on tight to each other, to share your love with each other. And as long as you do that, Ron's spirit will always be with you. May you always feel him present in your family and in your hearts. May we, his friends, also always feel his presence and be guided by his spirit. And may his memory always be for a blessing. We say it together, Amen. We'll rise now for the memorial prayer. Hello, Hasselie.
Echad, Hanul Verachum, Erech Apayim Rav Chesed, Hametzei Kapara Peshe Vekravet Yesha, Umenucha Nechonam, Kachad, Kanfei Ashechinam, במעלות קדושים את טהורים, כזוהר הרקיע מזהירים, את נשמת רונן בת מיכאל וברכה, שלח ליולמו. ענה, ענה, בלרחמים, זכרה לו טוב הכל זכויותיו וצדקותיו בארץ אור החיים ופתח לו שערי צדק ויורם שערי חמלה וחנינה בסדר כנפיך אז תראה יולי עולמים וצרור בצור החיים ונשמתו אדוני הוא נחלתו וינוח בשלום על משכבו ונאמר אמן. You who are gracious and compassionate, patient and abundantly kind, we pray that you grant infinite rest in your sheltering presence among the holy and pure, to the soul of our beloved Ron who has gone to his eternal home. Merciful one, we ask that you remember all the worthy and righteous deeds he performed in the land of the living. May he find perfect peace in your eternal embrace. May his soul be bound up in the bond of eternal life. May the Lord be his portion. May he rest in peace. And we say together, Amen. Interment will follow at Mount Olive Cemetery, after which the family will gather at the home of Jamie and Daniel Peltz, 4009 Orangewood Drive in Orange Village, immediately following interment today through 9 p.m. with a service at 7 p.m. and 1 to 4 p.m on Friday. Uh, technically Shiva comes to a close with the onset of Shabbat and the festival, but the family will continue to receive community coming to offer them comfort on Tuesday and Wednesday, 1 to 4 and 7 to 9 p.m. as well. Contributions are suggested to B'nai Yashirim Congregation, Temple Emmanuel, or the Jewish National Fund.